in various places. So we don't need to rehash all of that out. I don't think it's, it's fair to do that to you um, every time you're on or anything. But I do remember you saying that one of the things that you started to do as you re-emerged from a really tough bout of depression was to get busy again and to start doing things again. And yeah. maybe kind of 13 years later, uh, it's, maybe this is almost the first time you've been not busy. And it's interesting that a part of you now can maybe enjoy it that bit more than when you first retired. I guess having kids and a family around helps massively. Absolutely. Um, you know, one, one thing that, that happened when I, when I went into, um, I had counselling for, for six or seven months. I had an amazing counsellor who, who got me through it. And, you know, when, when we were at a point at a stage where she obviously felt I was I was getting better. Then we we bought a diary, and um, I was turning a lot of work down in the early days of of being depressed, and because I, I just didn't want to be in that place or that situation. Um, you know, I, I felt a bit hypocritical that I was in this I was in this state, but then I could go out and just sort of have a laugh. But yeah. you know, looking yeah. back, you know, it was probably. You know, I was my mind was elsewhere, and I could enjoy myself. But it was when I was actually going home and shutting my front door, and you know, rocking around the house with no one there was, you know, was when all, all the demons kind of set in. So we we bought a diary, and and she said, right from now on, you um, you know, you take the jobs, you go to work, um, and them days when you're not, then you ring your mates and you go and play golf. And this is why I've, I've got such a um a gratitude towards john aldridge because he was he was always like come and play golf with me you know i think he he knew what i was going through and he never let me down you know there was days when he was busy and he, he'd turn things down just to, so i could go and play golf with him so we, we we just filled the diary with different things and and you know i just got kept busy and got stronger and busy and then you make more friends doing different jobs you know we we come across each other's path because of the the media side of things and you just get a different outlook different perspective and then obviously i met lucy and you know and the rest is history yeah. so yeah being being not busy back then is certainly a lot different than being not busy in this situation because i'm an, i'm obviously in a much better place now stronger can deal with it a lot better uh, and I've got a great support network around me. I don't know John Aldridge at all. I, I, I literally don't even think I've met him. Uh, that's a really... Serious? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I have. I, he's phoned on the phone a few times, but I wow. wouldn't uh, know him. But he wouldn't strike me as someone who would necessarily want to... I could be wrong here, so I'm sort of asking, but I necessarily get deep down into the complexity of your emotions in a conversation. But it's I could be wrong again on that, but he, he obviously sensed maybe you did need someone to hang out with, that he's turning down work to go play golf with you. Yeah, but he wouldn't. He he wouldn't come across as I needed help, so that's why I'm going to play golf with you. He he just never let me down. I I look back now and think, do you know, I spent so much time with Aldo in the in the early days of of not being too well, and we you know we'd have coffees after you know after we played, um, we'd go for a pint, we'd meet up, um, and you know I think he knew I probably wasn't a bad place, but he'd never really speak about it. Um, and it's funny, really, because we, we, I mean, we're very, very close, me and John, very, very close. Right. And we were in Belgium not so long ago. And we we got up and we went for breakfast. We had a little walk around and we started reminiscing and, and stuff. And, he, and, you know, he, he is a, set, I, I, he's really sensitive, really sensitive side of him that he kind of opened up and he started talking about, you know, playing and how much he missed it and, mm. you know, how, how we're getting old now and... You know, you, your body just can't do things and you see things differently. And, you know, it's, you know, it was upsetting. It was ups It was like we were just together and just reminiscing. And and then the other day, I mean, I don't know if you've seen it, the Boys in Green documentary, which yeah. was an amazing, yeah. amazing bit of work by the lads that put together for RTE. And, you know, I texted him straight away, have you seen this? You know, and we started having a laugh and he, he was like, I didn't know that had happened. And, you know, we were laughing and joking and how good was that? And, you know, we just love reminiscing and, and talking back. He's got a real sensitive side, John, but he's he's quite clever. He's quite savvy in, in the fact that, you know, if you if you do need help, he, he's not that kind of person that, you know, knows it. He, he knows it, but he, he doesn't let you know that he's feeling sympathetic towards you. He, he's kind of like, come on, let's just get on with it. Get out there. But he's always there for you. He's always at the end of the phone. Or he's always willing to do something for you. It's funny you mention age. I was going to put it to you, even though I'm, everyone hates this happening, especially as the years keep going by so quickly. So yeah. I was looking, it's, it's 28 years since your debut for Bolton. 
Like I, some people just remain kind of young when you picture them. You're one of those people. Like I cannot believe in two years you're 50. That is yeah. uh, frightening to me. I cannot believe that. Do you have, uh, are you someone who's worried, noticing the years go by and having many uh, freak outs or are you finding, you know what, I'm happier with age and things are going okay and 50 doesn't scare me so much? Yeah, I don't, I don't really look at it as, as 50. I mean, when I was a kid, 50 years of age, Bloody hell, that was, that's old, isn't it? You're done. That, you're done. You're over. Oh, you're, you're on your way. <laughs> you're on your way out, aren't you? Um, no, I don't. I've always lived a very young life, if you know what I mean. Mm. I've always been active. I've always, you know, hung around people. Like, I love hanging around sort of the older lads. And, I mean, that's that's my favourite thing. I, I just love being with the older lads, Jan and Aldo and Ronnie and Ray. And, and you know, I, you know, the nightclub thing's gone. But I just love I love being around them and, and reminiscing and talking and have a laugh. We're all on the same wavelength and we get on really, really well. But I have got a lot of younger friends as well. Um, like I play golf with a lad who's who's he's a, a pro, he's 36, he's you know, he's got a great outlook on life, Alex, and we you know, we get on really well. And I've got other younger friends, you know, my wife's younger than me. Um and I and I always think if you if you think old, you'll you'll become old. Mm. Um, so I, I try and, you know, get involved. I've got a 19 year old who, you know, I try and stay down with the kids with some of the clothes that I buy, you know, I watch what he buys and stuff and think, and think, well, maybe, you know, I might, I might sneak into his bedroom and try, try a couple of the jumpers on his board. And if it suits me, I might go out and buy one. So I do things like that really. And just try and, I just try and stay young, mate. I just, yeah, I don't, I don't look at it as an age and, you know, I'm 50, I need to start slowing down. And I, I just keep going and going and going. And I'm sure my body and my mind will tell me when, when it's enough. But, yeah, it's it was, it was as you know, it was so emotional watching that, the Boys in Green documentary. Because, um, you know, I forgot, I'd forgotten how, how, I knew how good it was. Yeah. But I, I'd forgot bits. Um, the homecoming, Jack, you know, just being, how young the lads looked when we were together. You know, the nights out that we had, the camaraderie, you know, everyone played a part, the jokes. Oh, it was just, you know, it, you know, I was crying with laughter. I was crying with, with sadness at some of the stuff. Just brilliant. Um, just brilliant. And then, and then, It's very hard and to take it all in at the time when it's happening because it's, so much is going on. It's such a whirlwind. It is, mate. And, and I, you know, i forever grateful of being given that opportunity. I, as you know, I was 20 years of age when I turned pro. I, I thought it was gone. I mm -hmm. thought that opportunity had gone. So, you know, I jumped on that professional football wagon and, and just got on with it. No apprenticeship, no YTS, no scholarship, nothing. 500 and I just quid and a, and a bag of balls, I think, was your fee. That was it, mate. That was the start of it, yeah. <laughs> and then Bruce Rayock, you know, he, he believed in me and he, you know, I stayed behind training afternoons with him, working on all the weaker stuff. He got me up to speed very, very quickly, and then it just took off. And next thing, I'm I'm in the island set up, and I'm going to World Cups. And you just you just don't want to you don't want to stop because you you don't want it to end, or you don't want it to you don't, you don't want to be frightened of it finishing because you might upset it. So you just you just get on with it. And and next thing, this happens, and next thing that happens, and you know I, I just enjoyed every single bit of it. And you know I look back, and you know people say to me, would you do things differently? And you know, what's the point? It, it is what it is. I'd love to have won something. I come very, very close, like, you know, three, four, five times, six times. Some come so close to having that bit of silverware, but it just never happened. But would I change it? No, probably the only thing I would change was go and meet Bono at Slane. That would be really that was the one. the only Yeah, we, 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 we touched on that. When did, you, when did you play your best football? When were you at your best? Well, I have this argument with Richard Keyes when I, when I see him in Qatar. You know, he... You know, he, he reckons it was only a couple of seasons, but I reckon I reckon from ninety five to to ninety-nine, um I was just I, I played some really good football at Bolton to get noticed. Um, you know, I was fit and like just you know, just doing what I wanted to do really and, and just enjoying it and getting out there and playing, learning and, and that was it. There was no care in the world. I was a footy player on two hundred quid a week. I loved it. Um you never felt tired. But I reckon my most productive and, and best time was uh, 95 to 99. Them Liverpool years. I mean, I sat down and watched the whole Newcastle-Liverpool game and, and relived that. And just, you know, it just everything just happened. It was just brilliant. It was just... And, and what did you make of yourself know. in it? It can be painful when you're watching yourself back and you're like, oh. 
Yeah, what are you? Uh, there was a few times I was saying, "What are you doing? Mm. Yeah, how, how come you've done that? Why didn't you see that?" Of course there is, but when you when you live in the moment, you just you just do what you, it's instinct, isn't it? You just do what you think's right at the time. But yeah. when you yeah. look back, sometimes you can notify and identify the mistakes. But um, I thought to play really well. You yeah, know, okay. you know, like, my nineteen year old um, watched it with me, and you know it. Ginola turned me a couple of times and I and I, I had to say to him, you do realise he was one of the best players in the world around that time, <laughs> David Ginola. You know, he was lighting up for France and you know he was he was brilliant at that time. And I and I'd done a pretty good job on him. And then second half, um I, you know, if I was watching it, I would say I thought McAtee was outstanding. Um I thought him and him and McManaman were the standout players of the game in the second half. Really? I, yeah. I don't mean yeah, I thought me and him played really well second half. We we give John Beresford an absolute nightmare. He had a torrid. Me and him just doubled up. Ginola couldn't be bothered tracking back. Mm. And we were just putting balls in for fun. And, um, you know, it was just, it was brilliant. It was just brilliant to play in. Both, that, both of them. Yeah, that, that, that's great because, I mean, a lot of, so there your Liverpool years, a lot of players could go to the club they supported as a kid and, you know, in awe of the place and just be dwarfed by the whole thing and find it a, a lot to handle. Kind of interesting that you seem to find, say, an occasion like that against Newcastle high stakes that you kind of flourished and played some of your best stuff. Yeah, I mean, I've done a podcast the other day for somebody, and right. you know, we were talking right. talking back, and and you know, people forget that I'd had um, World Cup and international experience before, you know, I had time for Liverpool, you know, and to be alongside Paul McGrath and John Aldridge and Ronnie Whelan and you know these Packy, and you learn so much from Andy and. Mm like how to be and, and things to do and ways to act and how to play. Um, you learn so much from being around them, them people, them characters. So I actually felt I got, I, got, I, I was sort of outgrowing Bolton at the time. Um, I was ready to move on. And obviously then Liverpool came into me. But yeah, to walk into that dressing room was, was a bit scary because it was Liverpool and I supported them. Mm. Um, but in some ways, Joe, I mean, I think, you know, I think playing for Liverpool as a, as a supporter, you know, it's brilliant. But it, you, you, it's not about finance. It's not a job. It, it's it's just you're playing for your for your team. I was playing for Ireland. Who want, you know, I just love playing for Ireland. I got to Liverpool who were supported. You know, if they'd have said to me, "Listen, I'll give you fifty quid a week," I would have done it. Sure. I would have done sure. it just to fulfil the dream. But like. You, it's like every day is like Christmas. It's like you get off the train and you can't wait to go in. Yeah, the the the, the, the moments when it gets to you because of the the nature of the the job and the pressure of playing for Liverpool. Of course, it does, and you know it it's difficult sometimes to, to to grasp that when you're not playing well and you know the crowd and the journalists are all pointing fingers and you could do this better. You know, I'm I'm a sensitive lad, so I, I used to take that on board. Um, but the likes of Mac would say to me like, "Why did you even read it? You know, like what do they know?" Hmm. So. Yeah, it was difficult at times, but then, you know, th that would go straight away. I got back into training and, you know, I just loved being there. It, football actually became a job for me um, when I left Liverpool and signed for Blackburn. Um, you know, that's when I started questioning decisions and agents and why I was being dropped and, you know, arguing with Graeme Souness and falling out with, with other players and fighting with Irish teammates, we don't need to go there again. But, no. you know, football yeah. became a bit of a job. You know, I find myself arguing with referees a lot more. And, you know, it become a bit of a... I know this sounds terrible because there's so many people who would love to be in a mass situation, but it become a bit of a grind sometimes. Mm. Where Liverpool, and you asked when I was at my happiest, was then because I didn't have a care in the world. Everything was, was brilliant. Playing for Ireland and, you know, then playing for Liverpool and being amongst these world-class players and these top, top fellas... You know, what's not to like? Could you have stayed at Liverpool or were you just done, turfed yeah. out? You could have stayed. Yeah, could have stayed, yeah. Um, I was really disappointed the way Ronnie Moran was released. Because um, Jeddah, I mean, you know, I'm reading a great book about the evolution of football and how this happened through the 70s with Holland and then the French and, you know, why why the Dutch like space is because like they're actually, if you go to Holland, there's so much space. It's so flat and, and loads of space. And, you know, the Dutch, when they play football, they just find space, don't they? It's just, and this, this author was talking about like the way, you know, different teams and countries evolve a certain way. And it's dead interesting. Um, What's you, do, you, do, you, do you have the name of the book? I'm sure people would have, have a read. Ah, uh, um, yeah, I'll get it before I come we'll off. Get it before you go. Yeah, Grant. Anyway, so sorry, Ronnie, yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie Moran. 
Yeah, I've just had a text off Neil here. Are you able to turn on your video? Oh, yeah, are you? Well, where is it? On, on my screen here. There should be, a, so we're talking to you on Skype, and there should be... Uh, yeah, yeah, right, so can you see me now? No. Right, let's see. I pressed the button, and I flashed up in the top corner there, so let's see if Neil can figure out that. Get your tech department on it. Yeah, um, Liverpool has released Ronnie Moran. Um, let it go. But General Julia I took sole charge. I tell you what, whatever, and... whatever uh, we're after doing, the sound quality has gone dodgy now. I'll tell you what I'll do. Right. I'll tell you what I'll do. Because uh, we've another 20 minutes anyway here to, to riff here and chat away. Let's take a short ad break and we'll come back and we'll, we'll fix you up properly during the ad break. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. The greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen. Hi there, I just want to pay tribute to my neighbour Sean who's been, been going out every day to work on the front line and hasn't, hasn't made a single complaint. So I think they... They deserve some recognition on national radio for being so amazing. It's important to pay tribute to all those helping us get through these challenging times. And here at News Talk, we're creating a space for you to celebrate the people that are making your life that little bit easier. easier. The nurses, the shop assistants, the people on your street. In fact, anyone you think deserving of some well-earned praise. Call us on 1890 453 108. 1890 453 108. And we'll play them on air for the whole of Ireland to hear. Sean, you're an absolute legend. And from all of us at News Talk, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With Virgin Mobile, there's nothing hidden. Now you can try unlimited 4G data, calls and texts for only €15 Euro a month for 12 months. All on a 30-day contract. And better yet, everyone can try it. It's an offer that's bigger than big. See virginmobile.ie. Virgin Mobile. Nothing hidden. Fair usage and T's and C's apply. €25 Euro a month after offer ends 3rd of June 2020. COVID-19 is here, but together we can slow the spread of the virus. Remember to keep washing your hands, cough or sneeze into a tissue or your elbow. Avoid touching your face and keep surfaces clean. But most importantly, stay at home. While most people can make essential trips for groceries or medicines, if you're over 70 or have a serious medical condition, you must stay at home. For information, go to hse.ie or call 1850 24 1850. Protection from coronavirus. It's in our hands. From the HSE. These days, we all need our euro to go as far as possible. With everyday savers from Dunn Stores, we've got hundreds of everyday products, many for one euro or less. So whether you're cooking more at home or catching up on some cleaning, we've got everything you need. And we've extended our 10 off 50 grocery voucher from 10 to 21 days. So your euro goes further each time you shop. Dunn Stores. Always here for our customers. Always better value. Terms and conditions apply. Minimum spend required. Switch to SSE Airtricity and get an incredible 26% off your home electricity. Switch today and join the thousands of Irish homes and businesses sourcing their power from 100% green energy. Get your 26% discount today. Free phone 1800 818 466. This is a great deal. This is Generation Green. EAB 879 euro 22 cent. Offer from 20th November 2019. Rates valid from 3rd of December 2018. Subject to change. One year standard unit rate discount for new home electricity customers on direct debit and e-bill. For details of T's and C's, EAB, exit fees, standing charges, cssceatricity.com. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. The greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen. Now, welcome back. We're uh, picking things up with Jason McAteer. When we tried to turn on the camera, the audio quality suffered very badly, so we've decided to keep you in crystal clear audio. What colour top are you wearing? Um, blue. Grand. That's all we need to know. We know what you look like. So, uh, you were Fine. saying, I was saying, I was asking if you had to leave Liverpool those, you know, four or five brilliant years, and you were saying you yeah. didn't, and you were just mentioning you weren't delighted with how Ronnie Moran was treated? Yeah, Ronnie was released... Um... And then, you know, a lot of the lads found that very disappointing the way that kind of came around and happened. You know, Gerard had Gerard Hulier had come in and obviously the club were moving into the noughties and you know, Liverpool was a very traditional club still, you know, the Shankly the era was it, yeah, it was still around, mate. It was, you know, Roy and um, Tom Saunders were still around. We still trained, you know, like like they did in, in years gone by. Um and we, you know, we were very exp and a very expansive team. You know, training was all built around that attacking. Really, we didn't work a lot on, on 
defending or anything like that. And which it was all about scoring goals. Even you know we done a lot of crossing and shooting, a lot of shooting, um, a lot of drills like that. Mm. You know we didn't yeah. do very many bits of shape or anything. So you know Gerard had come in from you know a, a relatively successful career. Um, you know he was with the French national team. And then the, the obviously ninety eight the French had won and it was very trendy to be French and you know there was an influx of them into the Premier League um, players and managers what have you and with different ideas and and he just wanted to take Liverpool in a different direction so the boot room kind of once Roy had gone the boot room had kind of died off and you know I I felt the club be, uh, the way we were playing was was very negative um, also we he brought in Rigobert Song as well so I was kind of fighting against him and Vegard Hegem to sort of nail down the position. Um, and me not being the best defender in the world, being you know more of an attacking player, didn't really suit Gerard. It's ironic, really, because I'd probably really suit Jürgen Klopp, the way I played, mm. um, you know, on the wing. But for Gerard, it, it, I just wasn't a fit for him. Um, but it was my club, and, you know, I'd been there for four years, and we'd been playing really good football, knocking on the door of winning the title. I didn't feel we were too far away, but... He took the club in a totally different direction. Um, and then obviously Roy went and it was a very, very sad day. And then Maka was umming and ahhing whether he was going to go on a Bosman. Different players had, had sort of gone as well. Um, and I was just wondering where it was all going to go. And then I also at the time felt I needed to play f to keep my Ireland career going. Um, you know, Mick wanted players playing week in, week out. It was a very competitive team. So I wanted to play, you know, there was me, Kel, Stevie Finnan, Stephen Carr. So, you know, I needed to be playing. Otherwise, I wasn't going to be playing for Ireland either. And I wanted to protect that. And then Brian Kidd, who I got on really well with, was just ringing me up. And I got on really well with Kiddo. And he was trying to twist my arm to come to Blackburn. And then I went in one day and Gerard said, listen, we've agreed um, a fee of four million quid for Blackburn. Um, but basically, it's up to you if you want to go. And I actually took that as like, well, you've agreed a fee, so obviously you don't want me to stay. Otherwise, you you would have turned it down. Sure. So, so I went in the next day and I said, "Listen, I'll, I'll you know, I'll go, I'll go, I'll get out your there and I'll move on. I've got things to protect, you know, football. You know, I've got a young family now and whatever. So, so yeah, I'll um, I want to play week in week out. You can't give me that, and I'll and I'll leave. And then I remember Gerard saying to me, we were training up at Kirby, so from Melwood to Kirby is like a twenty minute car ride, and he said, "Listen." jump in the car. And i got to be honest, he, he tried to persuade me to stay. And I, I just remember saying to him at the end of the conversation, can you guarantee me first team football? And he just went, no. And I went, all right, I'll think about it. And then I just rang my agent and we just both decided that it was, it was probably time to move on. But if I look back, um, I should have stayed in fourth fault for my position. I should have stayed to prove him wrong. I'm always one of them where I do like to prove people wrong. Mm. Um, you know, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that, and it, that was one of the one of the times I didn't do it, and I, and I do, you know, I said before, tongue in cheek, a couple of regrets. That that is probably one of the one of the real regrets I had. I didn't stay, you know, at least till the end of of that season. There was still, you know, there was still probably another four or five months to go. I should have stayed and and fourth in the position, and then, you know, maybe got to the summer and and had a look at what was going on. Because I'm sure you could have adapted under Gerard, do you think, or n yeah. no chance? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't like him as a, as a, as a manager really. Um, he was all right as a fella, you know. He's, he's all right, you know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ring, <laughs> bring him round for Christmas dinner, mm. but you know, he, he, he was more of a school teacher kind of manager. You know, he would, he would shout at you if you did something wrong. He would, he would call you out in front of all the other players. Very school teacher. Well, he used to be a school teacher, mm. so you know he had that about him. Um, he was quite very strict. You know, he did a lot of things differently. Um, and I, you know, I, I always play my best football under man managers. You know, mm. under Roy Evans, Jack, Mick, Peter Reid. I love them kind of managers. You know, I love them to bits. I'll, you know, I'll run through a brick wall for them. But for Gerard, I kind of like he'd shout at me and then want me to run. You know, twelve mile for him and. You know, and I'd just be like, well, you know, you just had to go at me there and you've just, you know, pointed me, you know, brought me out. I remember one story, and funny enough, it had something to do with Ireland. Um, we had a game away and we, we landed in the airport. We were waiting for the bus to pick us up.
for some reason that the coach wasn't wasn't around. So we were all kind of hanging around arrivals. And I remember Steve Staunton, he, he said to me, what's it like at Liverpool? And I went, it was just when Roy and Gerrard weren't getting on. And I was saying, oh, it's a bit of a nightmare at the minute. I said, you've got, you know, Roy's boys who, like, stick up for Roy. And, you know, we go to Roy if there's a problem. And then you've got people who, you know, go to Gerrard. And, you know, Gerrard wants to do things differently than Roy. And Roy doing this and they're doing that. And it's just like, I said, I'm glad to be away. Yeah. And there was a journalist, because if you remember, the journalists used to fly on the planes with us when we used to play away with Ireland. And um, so the journalists were hanging around, and one of them was obviously eavesdropping. I won't say who it was. And um, he wrote a big story in the mirror, and it was basically like, Macketeer's like Anfield hell. <laughs> and it, like, and it, it just quoted me saying, like, I was glad to be away from the hell. And it was <laughs> like, so I, I get a phone call off the secretary of Liverpool going, what's this article you've done in the mirror? And I was like, I've not got a clue what you're on about. Because it was it was an English journalist. It wasn't in the Irish mirror. So the um, so next thing, she like, I think she faxed it to me wherever we were playing. And I, I remember it coming through going, oh, my God. Yeah. And then like, I got back and there was a team meeting. Um, we obviously got back on the Friday. And then there was a team meeting. And then I remember like Gerard, we were all sitting there. And Gerard just pulling this bit of paper out of his inside pocket. And he just opened it up. And he just looked at me and went, what's this? And I was like, oh, my God. And then, like, I was like, I, I, you know, I didn't I do the interview. I didn't do this. And then he was like, well, sue the journalist then. Sue the newspaper. And I was like, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember saying, saying to Phil Thompson afterwards, how do you sue a journalist? What do you do? What, like, what do you do? <laughs> what do I do here? Was like, they, went, just be yeah. Because yeah. I don't, I mean, it's very hard to be critical of what Julia did at Liverpool because they won yeah. things and they won lots of things, you know, in the treble season and all that. But I don't well, remember. Them, I, I don't remember his era with as much affection. I, I'm I'm not a Liverpool fan, but that that team you played on in the '90s was yeah. a, a very likable team. Like if you take away the Spice Boys and all that nonsense, actual just watch the games. It was, that was a fun team to watch. I suspect a fun team to play on. So I don't I don't remember the Julio team yeah. with as much affection. I, I I don't know. Liverpool fans may disagree with that because they won things. I don't know. Yeah, I I, I agree, but. It goes back to, you know, Gerard played quite negative football. You know, yeah. it was football was changing times and you know, and he it was his way and he wanted to do it. And he's got every entitlement to do that. And like you just said, it brought him it brought him the treble that season. Um they could have easily lost all three games, but they didn't. And, you know, he's looked upon as a successful Liverpool manager. But you're right, you know, you wouldn't want to sit down and watch Gerard Hulier's teams play. If you could say to me you can pick five games to watch you know, they'd be t games from the 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 eighty the seventies, the eighties, and the nineties, and probably now mm. maybe a couple of Rafa games. You know, but Rafa was quite pragmatic. He was, yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, but Gerard come in, Joe, with with this perception because he walked into a dressing room and we were nicknamed the Spice Boys. Now I understand, you know, but what I, what I was really disappointed with with Gerard was he didn't do his due, dil due diligence mm. before. Um, before walking into that dressing room, you know, he, you know, to find information out on all the players, to watch videos or DVD or whatever it was, it's quite easily to do. You know, make your mind up on that, not what journalists are writing about us. You know, we were a very, very good team, and probably two or three players away. You know, I'd say Sammy Hippier, if you threw him into our team, Gary McAllister, who came under Julier. You know, I think, I actually think maybe a striker, another striker. Uh, I actually think we would have won the league. Yeah. So we weren't too far away. Um, but that was one thing that eluded Gerard as well. He never won the title. If you look at then um, Blackburn and obviously Sooness comes in and that's been well documented and then Sunderland under Peter Reid, albeit relegation happens, did you ever kind of get back to really enjoying your football in a carefree way and back to just, you know, enjoying training and enjoying the matches or was there always... You know, issues with managers, agents, all the swirl of the world of football beyond the pitch. Yeah, I mean, I left Blackburn. It was it was really hard times for me at Blackburn. I had a lot of stuff off the pitch as well. Um, some deaths in the family, which was which was terrible. Um, you know, I had a young, a very young baby as well. I'd, I'd left Liverpool. Probably the start. Do you know what, Joe? Probably the start of me being depressed at the end of football. That was probably where the seed was planted. Right. Um, right. Although you can go back a lot 
you know into your childhood and, and whatever but you know that's for another day but um you know it probably was started then but I left, I remember Quinny ringing me saying, do you want to come to Sunderland? I was trying desperately to get out of Blackburn. Me and Graham were not getting on yeah. and I wasn't yeah. enjoying the football at all and I was desperate to move and I just wanted to play footy and enjoy myself and get away from things. And Quinny rang me and just said, do you fancy Sunderland? Um, he said, and, and you, were st- you were still only 30, by the way, going to Sunderland. It's not like you yeah. were over the hill by any means. You should have had, you know, great, they should have been yeah. really good years for you as well. Absolutely, mate, absolutely. So I knew... I knew I had a lot to offer. Um, you know, I knew I just it just needed the right manager and the right team and the, the right environment. Um, and I, he rang me, and I, I just, you know, I was like, yeah, get you know, get ready to ring me. What what do I have to do? You know, do, do you want me to go and hand a transfer request in? You know, and they were like, no, really, will take care of it. And then, um, and then the next thing, uh, I get a phone call saying that they'd agreed a nominal fee. I think it was a million quid. I think um, I'm free to go and talk to. To Sunderland, I rang Reedy. I said, what, "What?" And he said, "Come on up." And I went to speak to the chief exec and Reedy, Mark Blackburn. Um, I went to talk to him and Reedy, and, and then I was always going to sign for him. And then, you know, I was around them players. You know, it, it, it had a feel of the Irish dressing room. Um, you know, Quinny was there, Kev Phillips, Gavin McCann, Kev Kilban, and um, Tommy Sorensen. You know, the foreign. It was a great set of foreign lads there. Mickey Gray was there. He was homegrown, yeah. so. Stephen Swartz, uh, Emerson Tom. Uh, it was just and great, some good kids coming through, Paul Thurwell as well. And um, yeah, just it was just a great environment to be in. You know, the training ground was porter cabins. It had that feel of an Irish setup, nice. you know, not much glamour going on, um, but everyone mucked in. We had a manager who, you know, knew that team spirit and team bonding was essential. So he'd take us out for a, a meal after training and then, you know, we'd have a few pints and then, yeah, I just really, really loved it. I moved to Durham. So I got out of an environment I wasn't happy in. Um, I made some great friends up there and, you know, I, I just loved it. I just loved being up there. Mm. And then Reedy got the sack and Howard came in. Um, we actually thought Mick McCarthy was going to walk through the door. I rang Mick um, and he'd virtually been given the job. What happened in, in 36 hours, Joe, is beyond... You'd have to ask Mick that question, but I'd love to know what happened because I spoke to Mick and I'm pretty convinced he had the job. Right. And then and then Howard Wilkinson walked in with Steve Cottrell, which was... Um, loved Howard. Um, didn't get on with Steve. Um, and then it kind of all went downhill. And I started getting injured then. Um, I started picking up real bad injuries. I got I had a double hernia. Um, I had it done twice um, within weeks of getting back fit. I tore it again. I went back in for a different procedure. Went to see a fellow called Shielders in Leeds, Dr. Shielders, um, or Mr. Shielders, I think they're called, aren't they? So uh, I went to see him, Belgian fella. Um, stitched me up, got me back playing again. And then um, and then another time I really enjoyed was um, was being a, a player coach for Brian Little at Tramia. Oh, yeah. I just love that. I love that, yeah. I'd gone home. I was in a different frame of mind. Training ground was on my doorstep. And Brian Little is is like one of the nicest fellas you'll ever meet. He's just such a good manager, such a good fella to be around. And um, and I learned so much of him. I, yeah, yeah, great times. Yeah, with, with uh, Brian. Have you been watching the Sunderland Till I Die documentary on Netflix? No, I've not started. I'm, I've I've actually just finished um, Safe. So I'm I'm actually free now. To I don't know if you've seen Safe. No, no. no. That's not a bad one. That's not. That's a bit of a drama. Uh, yeah, um, but I'm I'm actually free now. So Sunderland till I die. Uh, I'll I'll pick it up. Yeah, is it good? Yeah, like it's it's um, it's very it's, it's very interesting. I'd say you'd find it especially interesting having been there and been in the area. So the, there's season one and two. There is different owners and different people running the club from season one to season two. Stuart uh, McDonald is the guy now, and like we. You get little glimpses of the players. It's it, it's as much about the supporters as it is about the team. So you get over the course of the two seasons, you get to know the supporters around uh, the stadium okay. of light and in the area. Uh, they come across really well, you know, like probably yeah. you know uh, uh, working very honestly for every penny they earn, and the club is just yeah. so important to them, you know. And you, it, all the cliches with Sunderland, like you do get the you're, you're reminded of the sense that if the team could catch fire, like the whole city would catch fire. Yeah. I, I 
Do you know, I actually related Sunderland to, to like Liverpool and Everton, like Sunderland and Newcastle. You'd always felt, you know, Everton do live in the shadow of, of Liverpool's history, legacy and yeah. glamour. Yeah. Um, and I get the feel that when I got up there, you know, Sunderland and Newcastle, very much that rivalry. But Newcastle were doing a lot better than Sunderland at the time. Um you know, we we got relegated as well, and some and Newcastle kicked on. But there is that kind of like a bit a bit more glamour about Newcastle yeah. than what there is with Sunderland. Sunderland is a real like you you just summed it up brilliantly there. You know, hard working supporters who live for Saturday afternoon. I mean, my my mates I not round with one of them owned owned a, a pub that we used to go to on a Sunday for Sunday dinner. Um, Sunday lunch, and I stay there and have a few pints Sunday afternoon. Eighty. Um, it was called the Phoenix, and we used to go down and see him. And we used to go down there, and we used to go and knock around with just fellas. You know, we there was no nightclubbing or mm. we just yeah. good, honest fellas who just wanted to have a laugh. Great stories. Um, we <laughs> there was a fella who knocked around with us who he used to go missing for six months at a time, and then come back for like three months, and then go away for six months. <laughs> and I remember saying to him. I'm probably giving it away. I remember saying to him, what do you do? And he went, um, I'm a pylon painter. And I was like, what do what you mean a pylon painter? He said, well, do you know them big pylons you see in fields? I'm like, yeah. He went, well, I go away and paint them. And I'm like, right, okay. It turned out he was like an undercover copper who went like, that was his job, he was a pylon painter. And he like he mixed around with us and... I mean, this was like, I'm not giving out again in a way, it was like 15, 20 years ago, but yeah. he's probably retired now. But He'll be he, all right. he, Yeah, he, I mean, just honest fellas who like, you know, and like we, I met a fella who, who like, if you imagine doing the gun sign with your, um, with your foot, with your finger and your thumb, right? And I, like he walked in and um, his nickname was Jimmy Bang Bang. And I was like, why did he call him Jimmy Bang Bang? And one of the lads went, go and shake hands with him. So when I went up to him, he just done this gun sign. But he, he'd had three of his fingers blowing off. <laughs> so to shake your hand, he used to do the gun sign with his finger to shake his finger. And they used to call him Jimmy Bang Bang because he looked like he was pointing a gun at you. <laughs> it was just like, it was just comedy. Yeah. It was just it was just comedy all the time with, the, with them set of lads. And they'd go the game. Quinny will tell you all about them, yeah. Um, yeah. pricey and easy. And they'd come the game and they'd be in the lounge afterwards. And it was just a great bunch of fellas who just, yeah, that's that's what Sunderland is. It's a real down-to-earth men's football team. Yeah, you got that. I think that's that's endured, actually. Um, in, in terms of what you're doing now, so you're a Liverpool ambassador, which is a really, a really kind of nice and, and great role to get. The TV presenting, you're still doing that, are you? You're still working at that? You're, you're kind of hosting as yeah. well as just being a pundit for LFC TV, and I know you do work in the Middle East as well. Where are you with all that? What are you, what are you up to from a media point of view? Yeah, um, Obviously, being um, doing bits and bobs for them, not as nowhere near as much as what I did years gone by. Right. Um, right. And obviously, because of the family and stuff, and you know, taking more work sort of closer to home, really. So, you know, a job might come up for the FA to go and do, like, for instance, I've done the Charity Shield for or the Community Shield, like the FA will ring you and say, Will you come down? And so you'll go and work for the FA or bits and bobs for them. But predominantly, um, an ambassador for Liverpool, yeah. Um, so I work for the TV, LFC TV as well. So we'll do all the home games. If I'm around, I'll do the away games, which is in the studio right. uh, as a right. pundit. But we've also got our own talk show, which is called LFC Later, which we, we film on a Thursday. We get some of the first team in uh, and we'll mix it around. Like we'll we'll get like Jimmy Webster, you know, the singer. Mm. You know, he, he could come in with, with say, like, Jordan Henderson, so he could come, them two could be in on one day. We've had, um, you know, the, uh, who else have we had in? We've had, like, film critics and just, like, who, who are Liverpool fans, just uh, really random people. Some mm. of the boxers have come in, the Smiths have been in, Pricey's been in. Um, Alison was in the other day. Uh, we interviewed him, Joel Matip. We've had Jordan, James Milner. So, yeah, we get a real um, broad, vast guests come in and mm. from different different things and so I enjoy doing that um but the ambassador role can kind of take me all over the world um and I'll what, go on tour because is that 
I mean, it seems like a nice plum job. Are you just flying around yeah. from one place to another, kind of cutting a ribbon and smiling, or is it uh, fulfilling? Or you know, what what kind of gig is it? So, for instance, the last one we did was in India. This was we got back and we literally went into lockdown a few days later. We mm. went to uh, yeah. to Delhi. So we'll go over and we'll put. Um, so say we'll go over on the on the Tuesday and. The, the build up to to while we're there is the viewing. It's called a viewing party, which we put on for all the supporters, clubs, and anyone who wants to come down. They'll put on a big screen, uh, maybe outside a shopping mall, uh, and then we'll put the game on. So we'll build up to that. So say we we land Tuesday night, Wednesday we'll go and do things for potential Liverpool partners. So say for instance, Standard Chartered, massive partner of Liverpool, they might want to put some soccer schools on for you know some of the schools that are around um delhi mm. so we'll go into them soccer schools and we'll take coaches with us and then i'll go there and i'll i, I like to get involved so i'll do the soccer i'll do the clinic with the soccer coaches uh, and then give out um you know all the medals at the end so for one of the one of the clinics we did for there was a fella over there who's taken in a load of homeless kids, because mm. um, as you know, you know it's it's difficult out there and poverty is is rife mm. in in Delhi. So he's literally given this opportunity to to these young kids and he's financing them through school and stuff like that, uh, helping them, you know, uh, find food and he's doing all this stuff for them. But he asked Liverpool if if we could do something with him and we put a clinic on with him and I went down and did that clinic with them. Um, I can see how then, that's up your street doing that kind of stuff, the clinics and getting involved that way. I love, it. yeah, I love it. You know, and it can be from any age. You know, we can do, you know, from sixes up and up to fifteen year olds. You know, I went to Hong Kong and done fifteen year olds, which was great. You know, seeing the talent come through and what they're trying to do there, and you know, so that's great. And then we might go and do a question and answers for another partner. They right. might want to put a question and answers session on. So we'll we'll go and do that. I was with Emmy Oleski in in Delhi. So that was great catching up with him and being with him. Mm. Um, and and then we'll we'll build up to the viewing party where we'll go on stage and do a Q and A before the game, half time, and then we'll do autographs and photographs after the game. And you know they get two thousand, three thousand people at these viewing parties. Uh -huh. So so it's a great experience. So that that's all part of it as well. I know when but, you went also, in. Yeah, sorry, Jason. Yeah. Also, we, we'll do stuff with the foundation, which is which is a. I'd say very fulfilling. Like we'll go into um, disabled schools and we'll do, you know, just go and try and put uh, events on or initiatives. Like the last one we did is Liverpool have launched their mental health initiative. So well, I went to a school um, of kids between seven and 12 um, and we'll just sort of throw around um, with mental health experts, you know, just, just the way the kids are feeling because um, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to help them with with later on in life. You know, the, the families, you know, the mum and dad might get divorced and, you know, we're, we're trying to teach them that it's okay to, to talk to people, to go and see the t teacher or mm. to open up, you know, not just to keep things to themselves, to, to go and get help if it's needed. So we're trying to educate kids and in, in, in this way. And I went to a school in Kirby and done that. So that was that was an amazing afternoon. Mm. Um so just just things like that, mate. Yeah. No, just that's good. That. That's 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 because I wasn't sure. Was it just will you go to the new Liverpool store, which has been opened in yet another city, and stand there and do ten minute interview after yeah. ten minute interview? But it's a bit more varied than that, yeah. clearly. It, it, yeah, it, it is that involved. Yeah, but a lot of it's stuff that you probably wouldn't see those doing. Yeah. Do you, I, you went in briefly, obviously, with John Barnes. Kind of, you, you were clearly thinking a little bit about management. Did you ever feel a great yeah. need to scratch that urge? Like, do you feel you would have could have made a decent manager, or are you kind of glad? You never went down that road too seriously. Uh, no, I, I loved um, under Brian Little doing the reserves, uh, and then Ronnie Moore took over when Brian left, and I, I still did the reserves, and I found that amazing to work with the younger players. They look up to you, and they listen, and they want to get better, and they're trying to get that pro contract, so that you know they're, they're trying their best for you. Um, and I loved, I loved that that side of the management. Um, going in with John was obviously first team level as an assistant manager. Um, yeah, it, it was tough. You know, you I loved working for Peter Johnson, who was the chairman at the time. But he he took, he decided to to slash the budget when me and John um, went in. It went from one point eight million to nine hundred thousand, and to sustain what they had was difficult. You know, I think if you 
if you at the end of the season get the budget table of all the teams and then you get the the league table, yeah, it will yeah. more or less mirror each other. It tends you know, to be pretty have, locked in. Yeah, I think the, I think the wages are pretty much your best guide, and that's the the, the tricky part. Absolutely. Yeah, at that level, mate. At that level, it is. Yeah, yeah. and the players yeah. think differently. You know, they're at that level for one reason or another. Whether the youngsters coming through trying to gain experience, or whether they're journeymen, or whether the players who are finishing their career are on the way down. So, yeah. it can be difficult to motivate them. Um, the best are at the top because of a reason. Yeah. Um, and it's it's not like that at lower leagues, and I kind of. Yeah, you know, I left with John, uh, very loyal to John. I didn't want to stay. Um, you know, there was a rumour that they might have asked me to stay on, but I was always going to leave with John. And then I went back into the media and I just thought to myself, I, I like the media more than I like being on the grass. Yeah. You know, I, I get my fix through the media. Um, you know, the, I went back into that and I got the job then waiting for the club and, you know, do a lot of stuff with the partnerships. And I, I kind well. of am where I am. Good. Yeah. Listen, I'm sorry to cut this suddenly short because I have to go to news headlines in about 10 seconds, literally. But just to say thanks so much for doing that and I'm, I'm glad to hear everything's going so well. So th thanks brilliant. a million, Jason. Yeah, I love talking to you, Joe. I think you're a brilliant broadcaster, mate. And listen, I'm here um, anytime you want to call, mate. I'm, I'm just sitting around. Good man. Okay, listen, thanks again. Jason McAteer. Good.